<clears throat> this is a general presentation video that talks about what I actually mean by Nordic animism. Uh, I'll try to address some of the, the misunderstandings concerning animism and talk a little bit about how gods uh, relate to animism, the idea of gods. I'll, talk, uh, I'll touch on cosmology um, and of course the specifically Nordic uh, modality of, of animism. Uh, my name is uh, Rune Janne Rasmussen. I'm a Danish historian of religion. I have my PhD uh, from the University of Uppsala in Sweden. And I'm um, presently uh, working to develop the concept of Nordic animism as a perspective on uh, traditional no uh, knowledge in uh, Northern Europe. And if you appreciate what I do, then uh, do consider uh, Patreon supporting me. Uh, what I do is a fruit of a lifelong education. But for me, getting paid for my work is like, like any carpenter or plumber, is almost a utopian dream because there's a general problem in academia that early career scholars uh, often live very precarious existences with flexploitation deals and uh, without any social security and so on. Um, partly because knowledge traditions in Northern Europe, uh, Europe are being dismantled by uh, neo-capitalist states. So, if you want to support me, there's a Patreon uh, link somewhere around this video. Okay, um, first let me explain animism in general, because there's some inaccuracy in how people tend to see this concept. Many see animism as the idea that everything is animate and that this is foundational, it's somehow basic to religion. And I won't go into the specifics of the research history behind this idea, just say that it is kind of an anachronistic, anachronistic position on what animism is. It's linked sort of to early scholarship and actually sort of racist science, where animism was seen as the beginning of an evolution that would eventually lead to white Eurocentric enlightenment through different stages of polytheism and monothe monotheism and so on. So animism was the marker of the primitive, childish other, typically uh, African or somebody with darker skin tone than me. Uh, but today this is not how we see and how we understand and how we talk about animism in scholarship. First, th there's not an equal distribution, distribution of spirit, spirits through the, throughout the material world. It's more asymmetrical, it's more potential somehow. We'd rather talk about persons, or other than human persons, and objects, organisms, landscape formations, natural phenomena and so on, they aren't necessarily equally person, personal. This depends on, on, on the context, um, because communities are different. We also know this from human communities. Uh, and, and, and uh, the world of persons is differently structured in different settings. In one specific place, specific stone persons may be really, really important. In another setting, specific tree persons. In another setting, again, some trees may be really important, but others less important. For instance, here in, in southern Scandinavia, northern Germany, um, people has uh, had a very strong relation with the elder tree for some reason. Uh, now, the, the British scholar Graham Harvey, he formulates the notion of animism as the idea that the world is filled with persons, only some of whom are human, but all of whom would deserve respect. And this respect is a key word in so many indigenous languages and uh, is perhaps the, the key uh, ethical concept in, uh, in animism. And this translates is not only respect for bear persons and pig persons and oak persons and hill persons, uh, it also counts for human difference, of course, and cultural difference. So animism, and another important point is that animism is not simple, it's not primitive. Uh, Europeans used to think this, and that's absolutely wrong. In fact, animism or animist knowledge forms are rather advanced ways of knowing and practicing. And some scholars tend to label it animism when we shout at our dysfunctional printer or, because that ascribes it intention and thereby it makes it into a person. Or when a child hit itself on a chair and then says, naughty chair, it makes the chair personal. Um, I agree to some extent. 
uh, but there's a really, really important modification to this. And that is that a child will also say that you know, the stars are 100 kilometers away. And in the same sense, that is astronomy, right? It, it, it is, in fact, a statement about distance in space using the concepts available to the child. Um, in, but, but in cultures with strong animist knowledge uh, uh, culture, animism is something you take a lifetime to learn. Elders are the ones that know it the best, not children. And it is uh, operationalized in technologies of staggering complexity. You know, these technologies uh, encompass ways of mediating and communicating with these uh, persons. Uh, this is sometimes called uh, shamanism. Uh, and uh, is fundamentally these technologies about creating, maintaining relation with these persons, typically through ritual, typically ritual of engagement or sharing. You give them something and then you create a friendly, respectful relation, a relation of exchange, basically. And that's the logic in offerings and sacrificial ritual and so on. Right. <clears throat> The specifically Nordic kind of animism is, of course, the kind of relations and relating, relation making, the animist traditions that are characteristic of Northern Europe, uh, where I'm focused on Northwestern Europe and Scandinavia, that's where I'm from. And there are a number of specific features, and I can only sort of give you a bit of a superficial taste here. For instance, you know, alcohol and the sharing of alcohol is particularly beer, is very characteristic and very central. There are also uh, specific kinds of masking rituals and there are specific ways of relating to the turning of seasons. If you, uh, yeah, if you follow this channel in general, you will often hear me saying that this or that is characteristic of Nordic animism. So there's also like specific kinds of sacred landscape. There's millennia of sacralizing ancient burial mounds, for instance. There are specific trees linked with homesteads, specific lines of spirits, whites and so on. There are specific brands of nature spirits and spirits of specific organisms that give human life, uh, humans life. Right? Uh, here in, in, in southern Scandinavia, for instance, the rye is really important. And this is Nordic animism, uh, the kind of animism that people have in Northern Europe. Animism is basically about relating. Like, for instance, the Inuit, they have a really important relation with the sea. And in this relating, the sea is a person, the sea is a mother. So the sea mother emerge in the relating. And humans can build a relation with the sea this, as a subjective agent. And this is sometimes called dividuation, the process through which subjectivity is secreted through relation or engagement. But that's a long story. Um, a specific question in this relation is God's. Is it animism when there are gods in a religious system? And the idea that gods don't belong in animism, that is actually rooted in the old evolutionist idea of animism, where polytheism was considered a higher stage, stage of evolution. But scholars don't really use these kind of derogatory, not to say racist, ideas anymore. And the kinds of religion that relation to these cosmocratic gods, uh, that can certainly be called a kind of animism. Sometimes it's called hierarchical animism or analogism, and you find it among Hawaiians, Chinese, the Orisha religion derived from West Africa, my main field, Aztecs, and um, European traditional polytheisms are uh, an example of this. These deities are com composite persons, uh, you know, like the Inuit sea mother is the Inua, the person of the sea. Thor is a personhood of a series of aspects of reality, a day of the week, specific plants, specific landscapes, persons, weather phenomena, families, animal, cultural activities, meanings, values, holidays, colors, moods, persons, places, etc, etc, etc. You could say that Thor is the personification that relates people to this cluster of phenomena in the world, in a similar way that the sea mother is that subjectivity in the Inuit relating to the sea. It's just a complex aspect of reality. Um, and animism is ways of relating 
And this is why it changes the perspective on cultural history a bit. So if you're interested in Nordic heathen religion, then that can surely be analyzed from an animist perspective or seen as a kind of animism. Uh, but it's only part of this animist tradition. You know, when a Swedish peasant sacrifices a horse to Saint Eric in Uppsala, then this is not a pre-Christian in any sense. You know, the man identifies as Christian, he even identifies this specific ritual as an expression of Christian devotion, and Christianity has been a dominating discourse in Sweden for centuries at the point where he's doing this. But if we take on an animist lens, then surely we can see this ritual as an expression of Nordic animism in changing ways of creating relation uh, through the ages, uh, where perhaps this act is related to uh, earlier uh, notions of Frey, the, uh, the patron deity of the Swedish kings. Um, so looking at Nordic animism is partly a scholarly project uh, of analyzing North European cultural history through this specific lens. Uh, and this can be applied to unpack our cultural history as majority traditional ecological knowledge, for instance. Uh, and I think that folklore and ancient polytheism are amazing resources in that, in fact, of traditional animist knowledge. <clears throat> and it need to be given scholarly attention as such, majority animisms. Um, and and uh, also, by the way, scholarship has to be applied to the rejection processes in which these kind of knowledge forms are being marginalized and othered as non-representative of majority people who are then supposed to be nationalist, enlightened, enlightened uh, rationalist, and so on. Uh, and this, but it also implies working with Nordic animism in a more cultural activist sense, like eco-animist activism based on our traditional animist knowledge. And uh, I've been working on this in different ways. I've been writing a series of newspaper uh, articles, or I've been co-writing with a group of scholars that I've gathered for this purpose. Uh, I've been, uh, in order to raise a serious scholarly voice for traditional animist knowledge forms from the majority populations. Um, also, I'm trying to reclaim and renew traditional animist Yule uh, ritual, and I've been producing a calendar uh, to make available this kind of cultural reclaiming uh, to majority people around the uh, Western world. Um, and I'm, I'm running this Nordic Animism platform on Facebook and YouTube and Instagram in order to sort of bring this uh, perspective into play and thereby also test it. Uh, so this is also, this is intended as an, uh, partly also intended as, as an alternative to the horrid and mean-spirited exploitation that our cultural heritage suffers at the hands of different kinds of nationalists, nationalisms and race nationalisms and cultural nationalisms and folkish positions and similar inherently uh, bigot bigoted ideologies. Um, so yeah, thanks, thanks for listening. And if you're interested in uh, supporting this work with opening a new perspective on Nordic cultural history of religions, then... Uh, that makes available majority animist knowledge for populations of the Western world, then you can Patreon support me and you can share this video. You can find me on, on YouTube, Facebook and so on. So thanks for listening and see you around.